Paolo is from Padova, and uh, is now a professor at MIT. So he started working with Nova and CERN, and he started work with MS01 and now MS2, which is. So welcome to the speaker. <laughs> so thank you again from, uh, for the invitation. I'm Paolo Zucon, I'm from MIT. I uh, work in MS in the last 12 years. And um, I would like today to talk about, to talk with you about uh, what kind of measurement we do and uh, where we added and what, what is the potential of the AMS. Since we are a pretty, let's say, uh, easy arrangement, please uh, stop me, ask questions, let's keep it interactive if it's the case. So, uh, yes. So AMS, as uh, you know, is a particle physics detector which is installed on the space station. Uh, the idea is to measure cosmic rays in the range 0.1 to 2 TV. There's no error, the E is missing on purpose because we measure also particles which are greater than one. So we use rigidity and not uh, momentum. Uh, AMS started in 2011, so we collected already uh, almost six years of, uh, of data. Um, and uh, it will take data for the rest of the life of the space station, which has been extended, not recently, sorry, uh, to 2024. AMS is not just a detector, it's a group of people. And um, we are physicists from uh, across the world, mostly from US at MIT and at Hawaii. Uh, from uh, several countries in Europe, China, and Taiwan, and then contribution from other countries around the world. These detectors are, are built, are, have been built uh, in Europe and around the world, and we elected CERN as home of our collaboration. We, as I said, we were launched on the Butler shuttle exactly almost uh, six, six years ago. And um, we normally um, relay our data first up to geostationary satellite and then uh, down through NASA interface uh, to White Sands and then to Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. And from there, we can uh, access our data and we push, push this uh, uh, to CERN. At CERN, we have our control center that is meant 24-7, and um, we are in constant communication with NASA, and we constantly have to check that the detector is operating within the parameters, and uh, that uh, the data flow arrives uh, and data we collect are actually used. Um, as I told before, uh, uh, some information about how AMS works, AMS, is a magnetic spectrometer, so it's based around a permanent magnet that is in this toroidal shape, but doesn't produce a solenoidal field. It produces a field that is in this transverse direction. So particles are coming in, they curve in the magnetic field, and that trajectory is measured by nine layers of silicon fracture. Okay? This way, by the curvature, we can reconstruct the rigidity, by the energy deposition in the silicon, we reconstruct the charge, and by the sign of the curvature, we distinguish, uh, for example, positrons uh, from electrons. Uh, the, um, a system of scintillators above and below the magnet pole allow to determine if particles are coming from the top or the bottom. We get particles also from the bottom. And uh, then we have a set of other detectors, like the TRD here, that is based on transition radiation that is an electromagnetic uh, phenomenon uh, that depends on the gamma, the Lorentz gamma of the particle. So electrons which are actually very fast leave signal, proton does not. So, uh, proton does not. So these uh, allow a, a separation between proton and electron. At the bottom we have an ECAL, an electromagnetic calorimeter, which allow very good uh, measurement of the electron energy. We have 17 radiation lamps, so we are, can measure up to T in the TV region without major corrections. 
and also this is uh, a system made of uh, uh, lead and uh, interleaved with uh, scintillating fibers. So we have a, a fully 3D reconstruction of the shower and, uh, and we can uh, do a very good uh, EP uh, separation too. Then uh, we also have a ring image sharing crop which uh, allow um, better than terminal measurement of beta and uh, this is useful in uh, uh, distinguishing different isotopes uh, in the nuclei flux. Carl, Go ahead. The number one, number nine, this is also silicon tracker. These are silicon trackers. Yes, we have, we have uh, seven layers inside the magnet bore, one layer on the top, and one layer in the front of the e -cup. Okay. So we have a large uh, lever arm that allow us to reach the TV region. What dimension is that? AMS, is, uh, yeah. yes. So the magnet bore is roughly one meter, okay? Uh, so this is roughly 1.2 meters. So all AMS is roughly three meters in height, uh, and including the uh, three meter in wide, uh, including uh, electronics and all the rest. Interesting thing, it consumes two kilowatt total. You can run it out of an hour. <laughs> Yes. So why do you only extend that to 2024? I mean, there's no, is it need cooling or? No. Uh, 2024 is the current l lifetime of uh, the uh, space station, okay? Uh, which is uh, a money issue. So Congress approved space station of 2024. NASA approved space station technically from the engineering point of view up to 2028 without further intervention, okay? MS is supposed to work there. If you talk about the cooling, you may have heard that we, we, we had some issue on a subsystem that cooled the tracker. The subsystem is, uh, runs, uh, is, uh, is an active cooling system dedicated to remove dry heat from the tracker, okay? We have four time redundancy on this system. And we actually, and uh, two pumps that stop working, and one that is, uh, let's say, it works not, but not so well. The fourth actually is working, uh, is working at uh, nominal performance. Okay, we have uh, there is, we have a program to eventually replace uh, these pumps in space that is currently being developed with NASA. But for the moment, MS is running smoothly and we expect uh, several years a year of, uh, of uh, uh, running. For further extension and to have an insurance, we are also developing this program of replacement. The important thing is that AMS, the whole AMS has been tested uh, at the accelerator at CERN, and uh, this is important because it allows us to have a, a very good calibration of our detectors. So what we want to do? with AMS. The primary goal uh, was to search for very, to primordial anti-nuclei. So searching for very rare uh, signal of antimatter. Well, yes, we can, we can, uh, we, for example, we had to reperform all the alignment in the on the space station because of, uh, we, we got a considerable amount of shaking during the launch. Okay, the important thing is that we have a reference and we have a calibration of the eco that is absolute, that could, could not be done on, on, on the space station and is not supposed to, to change. And uh, also we tested the QRD by using pions. Pions have a, a lower mass, so using pions uh, with the uh, we use pions at 200 GV, it's like using protons at, at 1 TV for calibrating the, the TFD. So I was discussing physicals. Physicals, then uh, this, the, the second uh, that one we, we discussed today is dark matter searches, still with the idea that uh, positrons and antiprotons uh, uh, being rare uh, component of the cosmic rays could uh, uh, reveal some uh, deformation in the spectrum coming from that matter ventilation. We also have the possibility 
of measuring all the nuclei spectra with very high precision. I will, I will discuss lengthily this because uh, this is actually really instrumental to get sensitivity on this. We also have some uh, sensitivity in uh, measuring uh, photons through our ECAL. And uh, of course, given the length of our mission, we can study the effect of solar modulation over uh, a full solar cycle on the cosmic rays. Um, what I want to, to, to discuss in this first part of the talk is something that apparently is, it could be more boring, but it's really, it's really important. Um, we can determine the rigidity dependence of the cosmic rays elements. Okay? In particular, there are a set of elements that are set as uh, defined as primary, <coughs> so they are actually accelerated at the uh, supernova, at the acceleration side of the cosmic rays. These are proton, helium, carbon, oxygen, and then heavier elements up to higher. The other elements, uh, like lithium, beryllium, boron, helium-3, fluorine, also in part the nitrogen, are mostly secondary in the sense that these elements abundance is is uh, is heavily um, dropped in the, the normal abundance of the element and what we observe in the cosmic rays comes from fragmentation of this element during the propagation this element stream through the galaxy in the galaxy there is this interstellar medium that is a fancy name for just proton and helium sitting around and so they can do spallation and produce this um, let's go through how we do the measurement how, how the, uh, the measurement goes through um, measuring measuring okay actually measuring the, the events we observe over some times for some rate then we have to uh, evaluate uh, the uh, acceptance for, uh, for uh, these uh, species uh, and, uh, and then correct from other detector effects like, for example, the, tri the trigger features. Okay? These allow us to measure the, the flux of these detectors, of these, of these elements in particular. This just to give you an idea, these, was, these were the data about protons before AMS. You see, you see in blue they were probably the, the most accurate before us. And this is the kind of measurement we can provide. For protons, we collect so many data that the statistical error is totally negligible. So that has been a precious uh, tool to study in detail the systematic about the detector. So this uh, allow us to get inside the systematic and this uh, the measurement that, that in some sense propagate uh, the precision to the rest of the measurement we have done before. After the interesting thing we observe is that uh, okay, first a note uh, what, what I'm showing you here I'm showing you the flux multiplied by rigidity to time 2.7. This is just for display purpose because otherwise you will get just this uh, very steep power law where features are very hard to observe. Instead, uh, this one. Is, is much easier. So the fact that this becomes flat here tell us that from here on there is a constant, apparently a constant uh, power law at 2.7 and before the, the slope is different. This feature is unexpected and uh, it tells us that some phenomenon that about uh, the primary acceleration that is here. This is interesting uh, uh, because, in fact, this is a, a slightly more accurate uh, treatment of what I was anticipating. Just a simple power law would, would expect something like this, and we observe this deviation. In this plot, you, you observe the uh, spectral index, so the slope of this, uh, um, evaluated uh, in, uh, in, uh, in ranges uh, of uh, um, of rigidities. And so we see first the effect of practically solar modulation, and then uh, this, uh, this change, this smooth change of the um, spectral units. This again is what something that was not 
there was no resolution to observe such phenomenon before AMS. The interesting thing is that we observe a similar effect also with the helium nuclei, that it is the second primary species in the cosmos. And uh, this is again uh, some more, uh, let's say, pictorial information about this. You see this, uh, the, the, the blue area would be what you would expect for uh, the traditional uh, assumption that there are single power law, but we observe this uh, additional, uh, this additional uh, number of uh, high energy helia. The further interesting thing is that if you take the ratio of uh, of helium over proton, proton over helium in this case, uh, you would expect uh, something like this. Simply because the acceleration mechanism should be the same, at lower energy there is uh, a, a cross-section effect in the sense that helium has a lar having a larger cross-section should tend to disappear more, but eventually you, with a, with a simple model, you would expect this uh, to, to become flat. Instead, uh, instead we observe uh, a, a clearly departure from this, uh, and uh, well, we can fit this again with some power law, but the, the point uh, is that uh, this points to the fact that also the, uh, the primary acceleration mechanism must be understood better, and possibly there are different sources, sources that accelerate maybe only protons, or only ilia and summed with sources that accelerate both. So as I mentioned before, we have the possibility to accurately measure the charge. I mentioned that we measure the charge by the energy release in the silicon, but we actually have several other methods. We have scintillators where we can measure. We can measure in the TRD. We can measure very well in the ECAL. So practically, we can follow the particle uh, uh, through its uh, journey into MS. Here you see the tracker charge versus the time of flight oscillator charge, and you can see how well we can identify the different elements. This allows us to um, study all the elements, but also, and this is just to show you, um, uh, this allow us to identify the, the vertex of interactions and the pro and the product within AMS. This is actually a, uh, a tool for uh, uh, testing our understanding of the detector, but uh, also is something that gives you the idea of the kind of precision we can reach. By reconstructing these vertexes, uh, we actually map uh, the material into AMS. Uh, we can also see the, the, the AMS logo that is on top, that is uh, some aluminum foil on top of uh, AMS. So this, uh, this uh, apart being really cool, uh, allow us to improve our Monte Carlo and, uh, and uh, to have it as close as possible to the detector. Can you go back one slide? Go ahead. Yes, so does this flaw have uh, an energy cut for all the particles, or is it for all energies of proton and helium and all this? Uh, yeah, this yes, yes, especially yes, because you know the um, the problem in principle is at lower energy, where the energy release is no more a, a MIP. At high energy, it's a MIP, so uh, the charge separation can be done. It's still, it's still a MIP, so the energy release goes a square of the charge, and uh, we can see you see up to iron, and uh, after that uh, you have still nickel, but then the abundance drops too much for us. So the next uh, most abundant uh, elements uh, are, uh, they are believed to be also primary, are carbon and oxygen. And uh, this is, um, this is uh, an example of uh, the previous measurement existing with AMS in red. You see that apparently there is also in carbon and oxygen, there is uh, uh, a change of slope. 
the statistical significance uh, of is is uh, is smaller, and uh, but this will be the subject of our income uh, forthcoming publication where we will try to um, attach a uh, statistical significance to the fact that also carbon and oxygen seems to have the same behavior as uh, as uh, um, helium and proton. You, here you see. You see that uh, we, we try to do the same. This is the zoom of the high energy part, uh, and you see that there is, this uh, uh, trend seems there, but the error is still very much. Um, we then move uh, to the uh, secondary components. The secondary components, the most uh, the most uh, uh, clear is boron. Okay. You expect uh, uh, to have this uh, this typical spectrum that is uh, that is going down at uh, a rate that is much larger than the primary components because uh, the secondary components carry a rigidity that is smaller than this primary after the spallation. So if you convolve the spectrum with the spectrum of the primary, you expect this to go down. Uh, nitrogen that you see here it shows this an intermediate behavior that tell us that uh, there are actually a primary component and a secondary component from oxygen and fragmentation. Um, what is still is really puzzling so far is lithium. Lithium is supposed to be secondary or even tertiary. So coming, for example, from fragmentation of bar. So you, you would not expect this to ex exhibit uh, the behavior we observe for proton and ilia. But um, we are now completely sure that this is not a mistake. And uh, we actually see an, a, a different slope above uh, uh, 300 GV in, uh, in lithium. Is the spallation dependent on the energy of the particle? The the spallation uh, cross section is uh, sub slow, very slowly dependent. Okay, uh, there is a small effect uh, because uh, uh, the idea is that the particle arrive, uh, the, so the carb let's say carbon arrive, break up, and the the fragment to keep the same kinetic energy per nucleon. That is preserved, particularly beta of the particle. Here we're plotting rigidity, so there's some slight correction for it, but uh, so the idea is uh, that there is a large secondary and tertiary component of lithium, uh, but then there is a small, a small primary component. And since the tertiary, secondary and tertiary uh, dies off quicker with the energy, eventually the primary component uh, gets out. This is our current idea. But uh, again, it points to, uh, to um, we, we need better model about the acceleration and see if this could include lithium. This again is just a, a quantification we, we, we fit with this, uh, with this function which allows for a smooth change of the, uh, the power. So our uh, yeah. APC component starting from that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's summarized. <laughs> so you see, you see here, we see that protons, helium, and lithium are undoubtedly uh, changing their behavior around 300 GB. Okay. Uh, we have hints that carbon and oxygen are doing too. But uh, the statistical significance uh, is, uh, is, is, is more. And uh, this, uh, as, a, as I discussed, is uh, unexpected. So this is the first, in some sense, result from our data. Uh, the spectra of the <coughs> primary components of cosmic rays have a more uh, complex uh, behavior than what, uh, um, than what uh, assumed so far. Um, let's try to look to, a, to another species that is very interesting, beryllium. 
uh, you see that the, this, this is one of the most difficult to measure because it's one of the, of the rarest elements in the cosmic phase. This simply because the beryllium-8 does not exist to decay immediately to alpha. So this is made of beryllium-7, beryllium-9, and beryllium-10. Beryllium-7 is also pretty particular because uh, it doesn't exist uh, normally because uh, it decays quickly by K capture, so it captures an electron. But when produced uh, in the cosmic rays, this, nuclei, this nucleus is completely striped, stripped of its electron, so it survives. The interesting thing is that among these, uh, there is uh, beryllium-10. Beryllium-10 is uh, radioactive with a lifetime of the order of uh, 1 million, 1.3, is written there, 1.5 million years, okay? So um, we can use this beryllium-10 as a clock of the uh, permanence time of the cosmic rays uh, in the galaxy. So how long they travel around the galaxy since the production from that point when we see. We are trying to also perform a direct isotopic measurement of beryllium-10, but that would be limited up to 10 GV per nucleon, okay? Then the idea is to use, to use a proxy. This beryllium-10, when decaying, it decays to boron 10. So beryllium to boron should be a, should is a proxy of uh, the population of beryllium 10 versus energy. Because uh, since uh, we have the uh, Lorentz uh, factor, the uh, changing the energy of this beryllium 10 change the rate of the, the decay. In fact, we, if we look at the beryllium to boron, we observe an energy dependence uh, with the, the beryllium uh, fraction increasing versus the energy. So we tried one possible model, one cross possible model of uh, propagation of cosmic rays, and we fitted uh, a um, permanence time of the cosmic rays of 15, of 15 million years mm -hmm. with, uh, a, 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 let's say, a considerable error, but not uh, not uh, plus minus five substantially. Um, this is again another important parameter that was substantially not available before. Remember, so far these measurements are based on the measurement of beryllium 10 to beryllium 9 at 0.1 GV per nucleon. So it's a completely different regime. That, that allowed to constrain to put uh, limits on how you develop a model of propagation of cosmic rays. Uh, similarly, just to show you that we can uh, perform measurement much better than what it, it, it exists, this is the boron spectrum we measure, and this is uh, the nitrogen spectrum. What is actually very important uh, is uh, the boron to carbon. That is so-called the uh, the landmark of the comparison about propagation of cosmic rays. The idea is carbon is primary, boron is totally secondary, and so uh, boron over carbon, it's a measurement of how much material carbon went through before reaching us. Because this boron is just carbon hitting interstellar medium and producing boron, okay? So the red points are AMS measurement, uh, with a superimposed with previous ones. And here I have just a mass measurement alone that is easier to, uh, to read, okay? One very important thing is, uh, for example, the slope of this boron wall. This slope uh, corresponds uh, in this uh, field uh, to a diffusion coefficient for uh, uh, in the uh, models of cosmic rays of uh, one third. This is uh, expected if uh, the uh, if the turbulence in, the, in this diffusion is of Kolmogorov type. This is interesting because other models that, for example, uh, suggest a different uh, 
origin for the positron excess that we've been discussing in a while uh, are, are pointing to different turbulence meters. And, this, and these models would predict a boron over carbon that flattens out here. So at least some of these models are already being excluded by AMS data, and AMS data are actually pointing to, uh, to this, uh, let's say, theoretical expected one-third uh, coefficient in the boron. Um, we can, as anticipated, we can also measure the isotopic composition, okay? And uh, this is an example how we do it. We have, uh, we have a ring image Cherenkov with two uh, radiators, Aerogel and NAF, and uh, we have a plane of um, photodetectors, photomultipliers, where we can reconstruct the rings uh, generated by this nuclei. We can, by means of this uh, detector, we can reconstruct velocity better than one per meter. Okay? This allows, for example, if we look, this is the inverse mass of uh, charged two particles, and you see that we can distinguish the peak of helium-4 and uh, the shoulder of helium-3. We can actually uh, introduce a, a template for the mass shape of this and fit uh, the uh, helium-3 to helium-4 ratio. This allow us, this is a, this is a preliminary uh, result. You see this here in red is AMS data, in black, Pamela, and uh, then other measurement. The interesting thing is we can do a very accurate measurement in an in a energy region where there are substantially no previous measurement. And uh, as, boron, as, carbo, as boron is produced by fragmentation of carbon, helium-3 is produced by fragmentation of helium-4. But the two measurements are somewhat uh, complementary. Carbon has a larger cross-section. So, when in, um, so, looking at boron over carbon, we can probe cosmic ray propagation up to some distance. Because uh, past that distance, practically all of the carbon would disappear at, uh, at, at limit, reasoning at limit, okay? Helium-4 has a, has a much smaller cross-section than carbon, so... so the, Well, at, at the zero level, you can uh, you can scale with the number of nucleons. Just, just to really to imagine the the geometrical cross section. Okay, then there are of course correction. Uh, so we go from four nucleons to twelve nucleons. So you're asking for those Yes. So with with helium four with helium four you can probe distances which are much larger. Of course, you are limited to the fact that you, you, you are uh, up to an energy that is smaller, but still it's an information that is totally new. It's so new that if, if we try to use some of the models, okay? So this is, uh, this is uh, the black line is Galtrop for the so-called Trotta parameterization. That is one of the latest where seems to fit a lot of other things, okay? Uh, but doesn't actually get even close to our measurement. These are other two models uh, that uh, start uh, fitting first boron over carbon from Pamela, or the blue one fitting boron over carbon from BES and IMAX, and uh, introducing two different hypotheses in the summer, in summer uh, diffusion coefficient. The point is that, again, again these, these, uh, these models so far are not compatible with our data. So uh, the idea is that uh, AMS is providing a set of, uh, of very accurate uh, measurement that uh, allow to, uh, let's say, first, in first sense, it would allow to constrain better this model. Actually, uh, we had a long discussion with, uh, with Moskalenko, that is the author of Galtrop, uh, with the author of, Ga of Dragon, that is another popular of uh, this code, that is not enough. They, 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 are, they are working in improving their models. Uh, 
uh, improving their models, introducing uh, introducing more complex descriptions. It was it was pointless to introduce complexity before, where the data would have allowed for anything in a large error. Now that uh, we have more data and we have uh, more accurate data, it's, it's worth uh, to try to improve the models uh, and, uh, and try then to reduce also the, um, the systematic that comes from the propagation. It's exactly because coming back to our physics course, uh, one of the things we, want, we would like to do is to try to find some signal from dark matter that gives some hint of what this dark matter is, okay? Uh, because we have no idea what dark matter is. Uh, in, before, before uh, let's say, uh, LAC uh, actually taking data, everyone was uh, confident, yes, it's the neutralino. We can all, we only decide if it's a wino, a bino, a xino, but now we are really, really, we don't know. So we have to go through every alley to search for that matter, trying to see if it appears while crashing proton on protons, uh, trying to see if uh, something happens that is uh, otherwise not uh, explained uh, and that we can interpret as, uh, as dark matter uh, scattering on ordinary matter, or try to look, for example, in cosmic rays, uh, charge or gamma to see, to see if this is something. Okay. Uh, as you know, one of our one of our measurement uh, is largely departing from the uh, simple expectation. I just show here the positron flux that is, uh, uh, in some sense, the um, the measurement carry more information. Okay. So this is the positrons as measured by AMS, and um, the green line is. Uh, the uh, positron you would expect if only cosmic rays, so proton on proton, proton on helium, would produce positrons that get into the cosmic ray stream. Clearly, as was observed before uh, by Pamela, and is actually well measured by MS, this, uh, uh, this is completely away from what is expected. The point is uh, uh, there is one possibility this is come from dark matter, but there are also other astrophysical sources that could produce this. And um, one of the most uh, interesting theory is about pulsars, where gamma could uh, convert into pairs electron positrons in the pulsar magnetic field, and then this charged particle will get trapped in the shock of this magnetic field accelerate. Okay, so this will produce a, a symmetric source of electron and positrons that could be injected. However, making this calculation about how many uh, pulsars we have, uh, how efficient is this mechanism, is, 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 not, is not easy. My personal, uh, this is just my personal uh, belief, uh, is that uh, uh, is that there is for sure there are some positrons for pulsars, but uh, there is still space for some uh, uh, a combination of signals, pulsar plus that. Matter. You can have uh, if, if you look in the literature, there is an uh, enormous spectrum of uh, hypotheses that have been put forward and uh, still. Like that. So, so how, how how do you uh, conclude that that the it can be a combination of pulsar and dark matter. Is it based on this shape or anything? Uh, the idea is uh, is, uh, is 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 that um, you see this seems to go down all, uh, apart the large error that are here. So it seems there could be a cutoff, some kind of cutoff that comes from uh, the mass of a particle. Okay. Um, yet the, the bulk of the excess uh, seems too much. People have tried to do this kind of calculation. If uh, the, the dark matter is producing such amount of photon, of positrons uh, by decay, it should have produced this all across the life of the universe, okay? So this is some kind of injection 
of, uh, of, uh, of uh, energy in the form of charged particle going around that uh, should have left sig uh, some signature in the um, microwave background. Okay. So, so, so point is, uh, in my if you include CMB constraint, and then you don't have much room with this uh, uh, particle physics explanation, and yeah, that's why you are doing some combination of uh, pulses. Yes, okay. that's, that's 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 my again, not from this shape, but the this is again my personal interpretation. So, as as I said, Carl, yes, previous uh, try, uh, it's the highest point. No, no, no. This, 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 this is the current one, and uh, we are, you know, since uh, the, there is this uh, this, this uh, steepness in the spectrum, we need uh, time to collect data at higher energy. One of the points of running up to 2024 is 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 uh, to to get error here comparable to here and add additional points here. One related question is, is it all efficiency practice that you're showing? Would you actually show the efficiency for the function of energy of particle detection and discrimination? I can tell you that here we have roughly, uh, in the last point, we have roughly 40 positive. Okay. And we do it, and, uh, we do it by, uh, we actually select, select a sample, and uh, we have variables uh, where we can identify that it can discriminate between electron and positrons, and we do a template fit. And uh, from this template fit, we extract how many positrons and how many electrons are there. So yes. we are not we're not cutting. So I cannot show you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we always have in a great inflation we worry about this. There's when you're close to your like when the efficiency is changing rapidly and the shape in the spectrum is changing rapidly. You can create all this grid So I would always, always wanted to see what the efficiency actually looks like. I've never seen it. Uh, but, but you can show it after. Let me see if I have some. No, uh, I'm for my back up. Sure but, uh, I can show you. So I was saying yes, dark matter, pulsar, secondary. Some some someone uh, introduced uh, hypothesis that change completely the propagation of cosmic rays uh, by and uh, this this new model will produce more positron. As I, as I told you, some of these models have been already excluded by the Bohr over Carter. Okay. The point is that we discuss about positrons, but we have another handle. We have the handle of the anti proton. And uh, this is an example of low energy, for example, but you see that we can actually identify antiproton uh, with AMS uh, by looking uh, substantially at the uh, curvature and uh, at uh, using the TRD to, dis to discriminate them from uh, electrons. Okay? So this is what we published uh, last year, last uh, September, October. And uh, this is, uh, in linear scale, uh, the antiproton to proton ratio, okay? And based on uh, 300,000 antiproton events. And the interesting thing is that the, uh, when, uh, when uh, the substantially the solar effect are, 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 are negligible, the, um, this ratio seems to be flat, okay? So you see better in uh, where we can try to make a fix with uh, touching some error of the possible inclination giving out there. This uh, is uh, interesting. It's potentially interesting, let's say. Because again, this, where these antiprotons are coming from, the one that for sure are there, if the, the, they come from reaction proton, proton, and uh, helium proton or proton helium. Okay. Um, these uh, uh, antiprotons produced in this reaction carry roughly 15 to 20 percent of the energy of the primary. Okay. For example, the most simple reaction proton-proton to produce antiprotons is for bronze. 
three protons and one antiproton. We need to conserve charge. Okay. If you if you again fold this kind of uh, um, uh, fraction of the energy with the fact that the antiprotons have a steep power law, you would expect something that would have some kind of maximum and goes down. Okay. What is the problem? The problem. Ah, okay. Let's stay here. Uh, the problem is that if you try to do this calculation, yes, you get something that goes down. But your prediction is affected by very large error. Okay? So we are in a situation where the prediction has an error that is larger than uh, the beta. And where this error is coming from? There are substantially Okay, there are three components, but uh, two are clearly dominant. Okay, the blue one is primary slope, and in some sense, we are, we, our measurement is are improving the, that knowledge. Okay, the yellow one is propagation. So this, this is all this this is this is a propagation model that are developed before all the measurements I showed you before so far. Okay, so some of these errors will be reduced by the, uh, the yellow band will be reduced by the uh, measurement of EMS, okay? The other part, believe it or not, is the antiproton production cross-section. The current measurements about that are not accurate enough. Okay? Where are those done? Yeah? Where are those measurements done? These measurements uh, are mostly from late 70s and early 80s, and uh, and they and they also are limited to some energy, so are very inaccurate. Okay, so one of the efforts we are we are uh, we are uh, uh, going on is also to try to improve this measurement. Okay, let me skip directly to here. Okay, so here you see. Uh, the, the, the origin of the antiproton. You see, proton, proton to antiproton is roughly 20% of the gain. Okay? Then proton, proton to antineutron, because that's the case. Okay? And if you include also the antihyperons, you see that proton, protons accounts for roughly, we are interested up to here, uh, for roughly 60% of the production. Okay? Uh, the rest is mostly proton and helium. The point is that some measurement of proton proton to antiproton exists, even if you would like to have that better. But measurement of proton helium to antiproton simply are not existing. Okay? So your proton flux is also larger than expected, right? Because your uh, first few uh, few slides you showed proton. Yes. So the, when you calculated this uh, PP2 at the proton, you included your uh, flux measurements of proton, those increased flux measurements. Right? Yes. So this uh, enters uh, in what is marked here as blue as primary slope uh, uncertainty. Okay. So yes. In fact, that was uh, was a, was a skipped here. So how uh, uh, you get how uh, you get how many antiprotons you get here? You need to know the primary, so the beam practically. You know you need to know the cross section, and you need you need to know the thickness of the target. Okay. Thick, uh, so the thickness of the target comes roughly from boron over carbon. Okay. Uh, primary, uh, you we are improving the knowledge of the primary slope. And then uh, the third thing we need, uh, that we need, we need to improve is the the cross section, the anti proton production cross section. But that's the last thing on the side. The ratio of log is purely what you need. I mean, oh yes. Uh, anti proton or proton. Yes, yes. That's this is that's our measurement. And now we are discussing that we we need, we need to improve the modeling. Okay. Okay. That's much less systematic, I guess, than any other because you're doing anti proton. Exactly, and that and that, that yeah, but yes. uh, we actually published the also the antiproton. Not only proton proton, but also he showed that the proton proton is twenty percent or thirty percent, and there are That's many other modeling. No, the, actually, uh, maybe if you go to your next slide, yeah. If, but look at that. He has many things. Helium. So it's not only the proton error, but also helium error. Helium helium is the maximum. 
It's helium, helium is, 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 is a small contribution. And then helium, proton, proton. Helium, proton, and proton helium are roughly 40%. 40%. So helium error is also coming. Yes. So you say many different, not only just proton. So you don't yes, yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Because, but that, that's because of the symmetry, okay? Uh, the, the cosmic rays are made mostly by proton and helium, and so the interstellar medium, the target, is made of proton and helium. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, LACB uh, introduced helium in the LACB pipe, okay? It's not so crazy as, as it may seem because they have actually, they were used to introduce argon in the beam pipe to measure the luminosity. So last, uh, this last two years ago we started discussing why you don't put in helium and uh, finally they were they did, they took the measurement, uh, and they actually presented the last month uh, at Morion, and uh, actually last week at CERN where we had uh, a workshop on how to measure this cross-section, what's the role of this cross-section in, in the accuracy, okay? Mm -hmm. So we will have a point of 70, and we are really happy with that. Then uh, we want to measure also at lower energy. So we plan to use, we plan to use uh, the SPS beam. The SPS beam at 200 and 400 GB. Um, there are already at CERN the uh, detectors. This is COMPASS, that is uh, a magnetic spectrometer with very good uh, uh, track reconstruction and particle ID. They actually have uh, some type, they, 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 they do different kind of measurement, but one of the measurements they do, they have a liquid uh, helium target. No, sorry, liquid uh, proton, hydrogen target. Okay, and already they already took data with this in 2008 uh, with 200 GB. And so I'm currently working on going through this data to see if we can extract already from this data a measurement of the anti-proton production, okay? They have a spare target <laughs> that is a liquid uh, hydrogen. And uh, we are planning to refurbish this, this target to liquid helium. So it means going with the cry cryogeny from roughly 20 Kelvin to roughly 4 Kelvin. It's some work, but it's, it's not a challenge. It's something that we can do. Eh? We want to use liquid, yes, for the density. For the density. Yes, for the density, because uh, because to calculate the cross section, you need to scale to uh, a known cross section. So we we, we scale to the, the uh, inclusive uh, proton helium cross section. If you have gas, it's much more complicated to scale. Uh, the the liquid uh, liquid target is the ideal case. Okay. Exactly. And so and so the we are working on uh, on this. Uh, to um, to possibly reduce this uh, this uh, measurement. Let me conclude with this slide, even if it's out of order. That is one of the most puzzling things at the end. We get just looking at our data. You see, these are with different scales. Uh, you see, they are the scales, but uh, it's about the shape. Uh, if you take the proton spectra, it's like that. The anti-proton spectra is on top of it. <coughs> the positron spectra is on top of it. That you should should not be there because it should mm -hmm. be like the electrons because <coughs> electron and proton lose energy much more than than proton and anti-proton. But this is our, just our measurement, and uh, and this is actually one of the the most uh, puzzling and yet interesting uh, overall uh, uh, result. <coughs> Having said that, uh, let me conclude saying that the uh, AMS uh, moved the cosmic rate measurements from 30-40% accuracy to few percent accuracy. And uh, we believe that this kind of accuracy uh, has the possibility to shed light on your physics. And that will be all. Thank you. So one question is, all the flux that you measured, Everything seems to be different from the, the uh, 
Thanks to speaker again. Okay. 